Welcome, everybody. This is the inaugural episode of Notes from Room 227 uh, with Douglas Marola. And I'm really happy to have you in studio. And this is going to be a little bit of an adventure for both of us. Uh, educational, uh, for sure. Uh, that's mm-hmm. the theme of, of the conversation. And I think for anybody tuning in and anybody listening, uh, this is going to be the consistent approach. Um, how we actually decide to approach topics, uh, whether or not we dig deeper, really the fundamental question that we're going to be asking is is whether or not there's something to learn at the end of that. And uh, if there is, then we'll keep digging. So uh, Douglas, uh, w- welcome. How have you been since we last talked? I'm doing. I'm doing well. Thank you. We had uh, uh, a little bit of a blip in my school, right? I'm in a. I'm in a bad neighborhood school. I like to call it. And when I say that, people come to all kinds of conclusions. And it's just the bad neighborhood school. And we had. Um, we actually had a two week hiatus because of uh, a lot of fighting and stuff. So we went actually back to remote, not because of anything. COVID related just because it was too hot, quote unquote, hot in the school. So we did a, a cooling off period and um, now we're back. So this is kind of how we do it in the bad area. It's, it's not really, um, it's kind of like a forgotten dimension of the school business, how things work where I am. It's, ve- it's a very, very unique place. Mm, mm. How did you, how did you actually, um, how do you gravitate towards working in a, in a school that has um, very challenging youths, uh, propensity towards violence, this type of thing? Like it takes a real special person, uh, you, you know, to to do that. How, how did you find yourself in that that role? It's, it's, it's a good question because I don't think I, I honestly don't know if anybody looks for that per se. I think the idea that people have in colleges of education and you know, kind of teacher school type stuff. The idea you get of a, of a bad area, let's say is, is quite different than the way it really is. So the, the, the better way to describe it is why do people stay really? Because a lot of times people go where the jobs are and let's face it, there's a lot of turnover, right? If you're in a, if you're in a bad neighborhood and um, like I started off in the South Bronx, I started off at a school called James Monroe high school. And it's by the, Soundview projects. It's a really, again, a a difficult place, but they had jobs. So I was out of college and I went into that school and in the New York city world without getting too talkative on this, because it's inside baseball type stuff, but people start in the city and kind of cut their teeth in a rougher school and then move up County into Westchester, which is usually more money, certainly a, a bit easier. And, um, you can kind of for lack of a better way of putting it, you can teach more, you can do a lot more academics because the discipline stuff is much, much less. So that was kind of my plan, to be honest, right? Start in the city, go to a place like Mount Vernon, where I am now, Mount Vernon, where I am, is right above the Bronx. It's it's the end of the New York City subway system, the very next two blocks, and you're in Mount Vernon. So it's kind of like diet Bronx. It's Bronx light. and um, And so I went there and then I was figuring, ah, but, you know, maybe become an administrator or move up county to where it's a little bit more peaceful. And it just never happened. And to be honest, it's it's turned out to be a plus because we have, you know, I talk about the violence and the fights, but we have a, a, a decent sized small army of like regular students who just want to get they actually enjoy learning. They're intellectually curious and they, they would fit in other than their lack of skill because the school system has let them down so badly, they would fit in anywhere. So working with those students is, I'm guessing it's more rewarding than like a wealthy, let's say wealthy white district. I'm, I'm guessing I've never worked in a district like that. So I don't know, but um, working with those students is exceedingly rewarding. And I just haven't, felt the need to move. I, I tried to become an administrator and that didn't work. Uh, I just couldn't, I couldn't get an interview. I couldn't get hired. I don't, if you see the way I look and the way I am, I don't fit the hiring mold 
in the school world. But uh, well, you're wearing a nice cardigan. I see her. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm glad you, I'm glad you noticed. You need an assistant principal. <laughs> well, I don't know where, where I would, I would love uh, for, for a principal of my, of my students or my children to have somebody that's very approachable and right. someone that loves education. That seems yeah. to be right at the top of my priority. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, the school system is so broken in a lot of ways and I'm in the North uh, Northeast, right. I'm in the New York city area. So there's a lot of the politically correct stuff and, you know, the, the, the race and the gender stuff plays a big role in hiring in general. It's not totally lockstep, but it, it plays a role. I used to check the jobs that I applied for and didn't get. I used to check to see who got those positions and, uh, they, they didn't, you know, they didn't, they didn't look like me or sound like me, but, um, in general, but, uh, it turns out it's turned out for the best, but yeah, that's the thing. Like it doesn't, it's a crying shame because a lot of times you'll have like parent like you and others who are like, look, just get a quality person in there, let them steer the ship and, and we'll go from there. That's the person that they want. But like a lot of institutions, I guess it's gotten bent and twisted over the years. Yeah, so you you I mean, given the right circumstances, you would have you would jump at a at a position as a principal or a vice principal. Is that is that the case? I uh, years ago, yes, not anymore. Um, now, because the job now in has gotten so uh, in New York State, you know, these buzzwords that are in this school business are are big, and one of the biggest ones now is data driven. So I see these assistant principals, and they're just shackled to their desks. They're in, and now they're in Zoom meetings, not just going to a meeting, mm. but they're in Zoom meetings now, meetings in the conference room. They're, um, they've got, you know, the data to follow, quote unquote, the data. So they've got to prepare these, you know, prepare the spreadsheets and whatnot. And it's just not, there's so little interaction with students from what I can tell that not anymore. Uh, and I may have dodged a bullet by not going into administration because there it's, it seems to be a very cold, soulless gig these days, which is too bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I mean, let's talk about these these gems of a student of students that that show up under your uh, or in your classroom, and mm -hmm. and so they would, by and large, they're they're a minority. All uh, they're they're all sorry. What's that? Oh, I, I I don't have any white students. No, no, not that. I wasn't. Uh, I was just referring to oh. the students that want to learn, right? Yeah, so the yes. ones that <laughs> that kind of minority. Yeah, yeah. So so they're uh, <laughs> so they they are the minority that want to learn, and that's the pleasure. That's pretty much why uh, I guess what what gives you purpose, so to speak. I won't. We won't really delve into that too much, but. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it must be refreshing to find uh, a student that, you know, wants to pick up the Iliad or read Shakespeare or understand the value mm -hmm. of that. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so tell me a little bit about that and, and some of the, the special students that you have come across. Yeah, that that's it's funny how the way you word it is kind of how my mind works when I think about this as well, because we have, you know, I do with the ninth graders and and. I don't know if it's a, how much of a minority, Daniel, it is that the students who want to learn, it's just that our wayward students, our disruptive students, we have many of them and they're, they cause such a ruckus and make so much noise that honestly, I'd have to guess that they're, they're not, those crazy students aren't the majority, but I, I know what you mean. It, it sure does feel that way, both mm -hmm. to me and the way, the way I talk about it to you. But we like going back to your question, the ninth graders, I go through I don't go through the entire Odyssey. We have an anthology, a really good one back when my, I, I, we had a chairman many years ago who was very much an academic. And uh, my chairman now is great too. It's just that again, he's burdened with all this nonsense, administrivia stuff. Um, but uh, we had a, an assistant principal chairman of the English department, very literary based, very much an academic. And so our anthology of the Odyssey is perfect for the ninth graders because it hits all the high notes and it doesn't water down the language. So when you talk about, and I'm talking about when you just talk to people, the oldest questions in the book, like, is it the journey or is it the destination? 
Um, you get some of these philosophical things like, is Odysseus a, a hero? And, you know, basic stuff like, he, you know, he cheats, against, cheats on his wife and he's put in some different situations and he's, you know, tempted by these these uh, amazing women and these, these harpies come after him. And it's just, you know, it's just great stuff. Um, people in general enjoy that. Like people enjoy a good story. So then when you throw in six headed monsters and, you know, blood and, you know, the, the crazy revenge scene with the test of the great bow and blood in the gutter. And, you know, I dress it up like that. I'm really kind of a salesman. Okay. And, uh, you know, there's going to be death, you know, be ready. Hey, ladies, how do you like Calypso? Right. Because Jennifer, uh, well, not Jennifer, uh, Vanessa Williams, there's a there's a kind of a mid 90s TV version of it. And it's very 90s TV schlock. But, um, you know, Vanessa Williams plays Calypso. Right. Hello. Right. She's magnetic. Right. Your eyeballs melting out of your head because she's just a, <laughs> just a just a goddess. Yeah. And so, you know, you it's made me a salesman for this kind of stuff and it works these kind of bread and butter journey destination conflict physical conflict beautiful f- women the, the whole idea behind the sirens with some classes it hits and some it doesn't i mean it's it's like putting on a show it's kind of fun to be honest yeah well i was going to say about the sirens there, there's so many I think there's so many cultural references um, that that seem to be embedded in remakes of movies. And it's so rich when you you start to see where it starts to surface in other areas. And Mm -hmm. I would say to uh, anybody who's being who wants to be creative screenwriting or writing as an author, um, a a foundation in the classics is almost Mm -hmm. like it takes you more than 50 percent of the way there. Yes. You know, it's it's like a cultural reference to uh, to the classics is like a head nod from uh, anybody that knows what a classic is. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. And so as long as you don't butcher it or you take it (laughs) for the essence of what it is. Right. Right. um, You know, like what are the things you're going to pull out of of these of these titles of these books and out of the classics, what are you going to pull out of them yeah. and then perpetuate into, this is the definition of the classic is that it's right. meant to do that. Right. It's uh, like this is bedrock. I don't mean to interrupt Daniel, but like this bedrock, just hearing you talk about it, this, these bedrock ideas, you know, like one of these things, you know, where Odysseus doesn't tell his crew what's coming. Right. So, you know, I opted not to tell them. And so it is because they're somewhat imbeciles, right. They're kind of clownish. It's kind of like they're dealing with a misbehaved second grade class of 10 year old boys. But, um, but I'm like, well, is he a liar because he's not telling them? Like, is he lying to them that they're, that they're, that, you know, that they're not having hardship coming forward and, you know, Scylla and Charybdis and other things. Should he have told them what's in the bag of wind? Right. He's, but yeah. he says, no, I, I can't, I can't do it. Is he, is he a liar? Like, should he just tell them the unbra- you know, unvarnished direct truth? or not and you know and then you know people are there's always some you know very well-meaning child of peace who's like yes he should tell the truth and he should let them know what's going on and i'm like oh really you know well do do you always just explain the full hot-blooded truth all the time or do you sometimes eh, maybe hold back a little bit right and we start talking about human nature and that's kind of how i sell it i said look this is a thousands of year old story and you're getting the guidebook of kind of like what we're about right you're going to get a map of human nature today while while covering this thousands of year old story from a culture that you don't belong to at all let's step out of this just for a minute i sure. want to talk about fauci and and COVID. okay and the reason oh, wow. why there, okay there's there's a very direct reason why i'm bringing this up because mm-hmm. um this is something where we have a leader in the in your country as opposed mm-hmm. to as opposed to uh, Canada, but you mm-hmm. have a leader in a country that decides to withhold certain information for the ultimate benefit of the group. Okay, I mean, mm-hmm. giving giving the guy the benefit of the doubt, which I think is is worth uh, doing. Mm-hmm. Um, it later comes out that it wasn't the entire truth, but i I imagine um, I imagine that people in a, a public position of authority and more of a conservative approach is to say, hey, you know what, we have the 
the the practical approach of disseminating information uh, like health information to people and we need to give them information that it's their responsibility as the leader and so there's some parallels do you, do you see that that the leader yes. does have to decide what to say and what not to say because um the i guess unadulterated truth is is not always um you know, it doesn't always lead to the best outcome. However, mm-hmm. I mean, that, that seems kind of obvious in, in, in some situation, most situations. So what are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, I, I, it's hard for me to be unbiased on this because I find Fauci to be particularly detestable and repellent, but <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, without, there's a lot there, but um, the uh the noble lie, right? This idea that I'm, I'm, I'm lying to the public about public health so that I can get what I feel is the desired result as a kind of like public health official. Um, it, it just seems sleazy to me. It really, it really just doesn't sit well um, it, at all because, and part of it that is not in his, you know, it doesn't help him at all is that he, said before right part of the lie part he said no this is this is what we want this is the these are these are numbers and this is how it's going to go and these are the facts and then when he's called out on it like hey wait a minute you didn't tell the truth he's like yeah but i was trying to i think he said he was trying to uh up the vaccination rate i think he was saying like well if if i didn't if i had said what the real numbers were then people wouldn't be motivated to get vaccinated and right. I'm, I mean, I don't know, like it's it's like I just, it's like putting putting, you know, green beans in with the cake for so your kid can eat, you know, something green for dinner. Like it's it's shysty. It's it's underhanded. So and someone in that position, you really shouldn't have to resort to that kind of thing. Yeah. You know, like, all right, fine. If it's a, if it's if it's in a different situation with a little with less gravitas than that. But and then he just brushes it aside like, well, I wanted this to be the case. I wanted this to be the I wanted these rates to happen in a in a, in a on a stage that large when you're talking about, you know, sickness, health, death, maybe it it's just not it's not uh, it's not it doesn't sit well with me at all. But but it is very much toward this idea of maybe Fauci should read the, maybe he should reread the classics if he read them the first time because because they've got the answers in there, right? You can, you can hear the answers come off the page. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, I think there's, you know, we're, we're kind of delving into this, you know, political divide of, of liberal and conservative. And, Mm -hmm. And recently I've been, you know, really trying to understand both sides and really, uh, understand a, um, a conservative approach. I I think we we talked off air. I said that you know I I grew up in the in the Texas version of, of mm. Canada, uh, in in Alberta, which is very oil centric, mm-hmm. uh, conservative mentality, entrepreneurial, um, y- you know, very. I, I I watched Rush Limbaugh when I was a young when I was <laughs> a young chap, right? <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> I, I thought that was a great idea. He says, you know, women shouldn't be in war, and then and then right. the rationale was, well, because they're 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 infinitely more targeted for reasons that males would know. Yes, uh, not a justification. That's just we want to protect them. And I, mm-hmm. uh, I, I've I've talked about this before, and I call it the um, uh, you know the Titanic effect. And I wonder what is it about our society right now that wouldn't. Uh, if the ship was going down, wouldn't put the women and children first. Um, and um, that seems to be like uh, like uh, chivalry. And it, it mm-hmm. seems to be like the manly thing to do. Right. Um, and yet it's such an odd, perverse society that the, you know, the male is, is uh, you know, backseated to, um, you know, it's no longer our turn, so to speak. And it, it just, it, it feels weird, especially myself raising two boys thinking mm-hmm. you know they're confused they really are they they don't they don't understand why things are the way they are and right. 
Yeah. And it's funny that you talk about, you know, you say like conservative stuff. I, I don't know if you still lean that way to a degree, maybe not, but it's, I, I'm a Upper West Side, Manhattan, New York Democrat by birth. Um, and was until probably the early 2000s, probably, yeah, let's say 05 or 06, you're kind of garden variety, card carrying liberal Democrat in New York City. Uh, as crazy as that sounds, mm-hmm. we're talking decades of that kind of mindset. And um, in a way, I had the same kind of epiphany, confused epiphany that your children have, because I was I had been in the New York City system teaching and I was at Mount Vernon, which is, again, it's kind of like New York City, kind of same stuff, same demographic, just about. And I was just looking around. And I'm like, this doesn't work. Like nothing around here works. And I keep hearing about how these, let's say conservatives, just for shorthand, or Republicans, I guess, you know, I keep I keep hearing about how they're wrong and they're terrible and they're just, you know, they, they just have everything backwards. And and so I just out of I don't know even know what it was. I just said, well, let me see what these people have to say. And and that was the beginning of the end of me being uh, again a kind of garden variety. Democrat. And then I was for an embarrassing two years, a a national review reading Republican. And then I went straight and became more libertarian. And wow, uh, that's a big, yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, really my, my, my voting record, I'm not ashamed of it at all. It was Clinton, Clinton, Gore, Kerry, John McCain, which I'm probably the most embarrassed by. Right. That was ludicrous. And that was, you know, that was unfortunate. And then I wrote in Ron Paul. Uh, and then Trump. So, you know, it's, and, and I just try to do the best I can with what I have. And none of those people necessarily fit the bill really for anything that I'm about per se. But, uh, like your, like your, your sons, you know, they, they're, it's almost like society is going against the grain of what they feel inside to a degree. Is that what you're talking about? Where they, they're looking around confused. Well, they're they're looking around confused, wondering why there's a lineup and the girls are always at the front of the lineup, you know, right. and and, you know, somewhat metaphorically, but it mm-hmm. is it's it's a, it's 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 very odd. And I think it even confuses girls because mm-hmm. they're like, why am I? I don't you know, I don't get it. I don't understand. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it typically Hollywood, for example, um, you know, infiltrates that and it's a little yes. bit more left leaning and so mm-hmm. you have you know superheroes in marvel that just it wasn't written that way and you know it's you know it's being reconstructed in a way that 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 gives women more of a chance and um you, you know if you put your hand up to have a conversation about it it's you know you're yeah you could be canceled uh, effectively yes. and and that's just odd to me. Um, mm-hmm. I, I like to stay more moderate, but as a, mm-hmm. as, as a thinking philosopher, I look at, at, at both sides and realizing these are p- very um, paralyzing forces mm-hmm. and realizing that academia, where much of philosophy and academic thought lives, uh, is, is very left-leaning and quite, o- quite often uh, very marxist orientated. Mm-hmm. And that's something I've had a really hard time wrapping my head around. I keep going back to mm-hmm. it, but very very rarely see the value in it um mm-hmm. despite some of the co-hosts the, the show that we do with uh professor steve keen he's uh mm-hmm. um we've got a uh, uh, scott heffler and he's you know i mean that's just that's just how he thinks and mm-hmm. uh you know i i find that it's a very one-sided conversation because um if it's challenged uh, the, the, the response is typically, well, you don't understand. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Explain it to me then, because I've, yeah. I've, I've actually spent a lot of time in that type of literature mm-hmm. and I just, I, I, I don't get it. I, is it the, is it the, the leftist philosophy that you don't get? Is that the, cause I'm, I'm with you on that in this, in the sense of, um, there's so much, you know, there's a lot that, I mean, we're talking about a gigantic topic now in terms of yeah. like academia and whatnot, but um, to, to bring it back a little bit, what you were talking about with the, you know, the girls at the head of the line and uh, your, your son's seeing this and you see it in academia. Um, 
uh, and even stuff like in Hollywood and and the comic book industry, you know, characters being rewritten. You I, you you were very polite. You said reconstructed in a certain way, and I'm gonna. I think I think what you meant to say was destroyed. So <laughs> like you you look at <laughs> you look at the comic books, and I'm a comic book person, right? You don't you don't know anybody like me between 1977 and about 1992. Marvel or DC, I, I've got it. I either own it or can talk about it intelligently. Um, big reader of comic books. And they were great stories and exceedingly well-written. So um, these people are, you know, they're not even, I would say, leftist. I don't, I don't think that anymore. An honorable Marxist, an honorable leftist is anti-war, has a tripwire sensitivity for organized power, recognizes it, calls it out, and, you know, um, and, and doesn't, you know, bend the knee to the mob if it's not fulfilling those kinds of principles. Now, I disagree with the leftist Marxist principles, but those people at least have honor. And some of them have been cast out and canceled, uh, you know, already. Like you, you already have that now because the new, it's this new kind of woke social justice stuff that is mislabeled left that has infiltrated much of academia you know most colleges i can't even imagine going onto a college campus these days um and trying to do anything even reasonably independent because you know you as you'd say you'd get canceled people would scream in your face i happen to be lucky in that i'm a tenured teacher in new york state and i in effect can't be canceled i've had people try before i got perma banned off of twitter Somebody tried to get me fired, which was laughable. I mean, we had a good laugh about it at work. Um, my boss and I, we, we chuckled about it every, even now. But uh, you seem so reasonable. Like, <laughs> I am I reasonable. The, I just don't the, get it. The, <laughs> the, uh, it's not, it is not I who am unreasonable. It's the weirdos out there who, I'll, the quick thing with Twitter is, you know, the 4chan people had, said, you know, print up, it's okay to be white and tape it on university doors of like all the main academic hall. So there'd be these <laughs> pieces of printer paper and, you know, 32 point font. It's okay. Just, it's okay to be white. No, no punctuation, no images, no nothing. And of course it drove the campus crazies. So, you know, mental, you, you, you'd have thought they dropped an atom bomb on their lap. So I tweeted out, it's okay to be white. Right. And I was myself on Twitter. It was my picture. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it was where I work, teacher. I'm not going to do stuff anonymously. It's a cop out. Mm. And some guys, you know, told me how terrible a person I was in, in a rough way. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a punk. Right. I'm in a rough area all day. So some anonymous twit on Twitter is not getting me shaken up. So I told him all kinds of things and invited him to do some anatomical impossibilities to himself. And, <laughs> you know, with, you know, laced with profanity. Yeah. And that didn't get me kicked off. Okay. But he did contact my boss and we had a laugh about it. What got me booted was I then called him retarded. And boom, done. Hmm. So at least I think that was it. I did mention Owen Benjamin uh, as well. So that might have been the case as well but i got permabanned you know you've been permanently suspended from twitter so i'm you know i'm not i, I you see me daniel this is the, this is what you get right this is yeah. this is the show um but some of the people that are really just out there this kind of woke nonsense it gets destructive when they're in positions of power right when they're yeah. when they're at the universities and they're and they've got clout and um and and i don't get it either i i don't know how long it can last i don't i don't understand understand the end game but you know i see these people destroying more than they create that's for sure yeah i i mean regardless i've been actually spending some time thinking about the responsibility that goes with power and i think that's really the i think that's really what what anybody who has power or is searching for power has to understand Mm -hmm. um, and and to offer a little bit of criticism against I uh, I someone I really adore, that. actually, um, Was it the uh, Joe Rogan. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, he had uh, Peter Atia, who's a brilliant MD, has a really really great uh, podcast 
called The Drive. Mm. Really great, awesome, amazing oh, yeah, uh, medical advice. And, you know, they just, they went into probably an hour of talking about very expensive watches and, you know, like ridiculous cars and, you know, I've got 18 <laughs> cars and I've got this and I've got that and I got, you know, and it's just, and I felt disappointed about it. Mm. Uh, I, I would never want to virtue signal them to say that that's not the right thing to do, but right. exceedingly, Joe Rogan is the biggest name in media. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like um, when I was younger, the Michael Jordan, for example, uh, or Wayne Gretzky, for example, mm -hmm. like these were my sports heroes because yeah. I was 40, right? Um, right. Uh, you know, I used to run track and field. So nice. I had Michael Johnson and uh, Donovan Bailey. I actually ran against Donovan Bailey in track. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. How'd that turn out? I lost. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you a know, track guy. Yeah. yeah. Me too. Yeah. 11.48 on a hundred meter was my, nice. My hey, that's legit. I'm not, yeah. I'm not trying to make you feel better. That's legit. You have some real speed. Not anymore. I, well, I, yeah. I I creak when I get up off the couch. You I was know, your so. garden variety 430 miler. <laughs> so my knees are shot. You can, it is not happening. Yeah. So I'm saying I I'm, I'm watching this and I, I remember back in the day when my, my, my track coach had told me, he says, you just have the wrong color of genetics. <laughs> and I'm like, Hey, ha, you know what? That's just the way it is. You know, right, that's right. just the way it is. Yeah. My track but, coach would have said, God made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he would have told you. <laughs> yeah. And so what I think the thing is, is that, you know, they, they're heroes for, yes. for young people. I, I, I can mm -hmm. still get weepy eyed when I watch the Olympics and I see somebody standing on the podium mm -hmm. because it, I, I did dreamed of that, of right. standing and winning a gold medal. I mean, yeah, it's just like that drives you towards that goal. It just like you right. imagine what it would be like and, you just can't help but think that, right? Mm -hmm. So what I try to explain to people, this isn't about turn-taking. This is about a responsibility of being a hero, being a role model. Um, and are can you live up to that challenge? It's a huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so talking about Joe Rogan again, bringing back to the conversation. So um, I do. I love Joe. He's great. He's got a lot of really good qualities. But mm -hmm. the issue is, is that he's – now probably on the realm to being a billionaire soon, if if not already. Mm -hmm. um, and um, well, I shouldn't say that, but he, like I don't know how much he got the deal. You know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. He's ridiculous. like king, yeah. king of media right now, right? Right, right. And and I'm thinking, is that is that what it's about? You know, to have the collection of 150 watches and umpteen number of cars, and and I'm just like, what? Yeah. What? Why? You yeah. Know, like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's one of those things. Yeah. It's like, how do you, and would we be any different? I like to think that I would be more boring, that I wouldn't splurge. Um, and that I would, you know, maybe keep a better head on my shoulders. Like if I were in Rogan's shoes, it wouldn't be an hour on look at, you know, I've got all these watches and all these cars and stuff that it would be more, I like to think that I'm immune from that. I don't know if I would be, but I, I think of, um, in, uh, you, you follow, obviously you mentioned Jordan, you followed some basketball. Well, Charles Barkley, remember he was with the Sixers when he came into the NBA and in his first book, um, he became, he goes to Philadelphia and he bought like five or six cars, a bunch of cars. And Moses Malone and Dr. J took him aside and they're like, how many of these can you drive at once? He's like, one, give back the other four. What? That's how you do it. You can only drive one. You don't need four. There's only one of you. Pick the one you want and do that. This is the first trap that you've fallen into. Don't do it again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe Rogan is so big. I mean, what does he get? Eight million downloads per podcast. And, you know, the, the, the social justice MSNBC hosts and CNN people, they get 800,000 in a week and he gets 8 million per episode. Um, maybe that kind of juice, that kind of pull, 
you know, this is back to the the themes of the classics. Maybe it changes a person. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I don't know. I mean, maybe he's not too far gone because Rogan's guest list is fantastic. I learned from, you know, I learned about Gary Taubes from him, the guy, uh, uh, the Daily Apple, I can't, Mark Sisson. Like these, you know, his his stuff on health years ago, man, I was hooked. Yeah. And I don't listen to Rogan as much anymore. And I think maybe some of it is because of that. I, I go and see if there's a guest that I recognize exactly. and know. Yeah. But yeah. it used to be every, almost every episode I'd put in my headphones and go for a walk or a jog or whatever and, and listen, but not, not anymore. So I don't know. Yeah. I just, I, you know, I, I was thinking to myself, I was, I was thinking, you know, if, if, if by chance we found out um, that he really wasn't, um, you know, so flamboyant with his his money or his habits mm-hmm. or so on and so forth. You'd think, well, he really gives a well, I shouldn't say this, because uh, he could really, really give a shit about what he's doing. Uh, right. I, I think it's his ability to be able to to cut through all the bullshit, right? Yes. And and ask hard questions. Right. Um, and so that in itself is probably more than sufficient as as valuable to be able to get him where he is and he and he um he owns it and he deserves it it's Mm -hmm. only the disappointing thing is to say you know that that we have you know millions of 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 people and children and young people watching this trying to think that's what success means Mm -hmm. and and i think that's what the classics does for me is it starts to resubstantiate some of these things about um, you know, say for example, you know, reading Plato or Aristotle or, or mm-hmm. you know, some of these these um, these works that I think um, are worth returning to, and mm-hmm. modeling ourselves in in the best quality and the best light of of the wisdom that 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 comes out of this. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, in the Hellenic tradition and even before in ancient Greece, you have. Um, you know, nothing in excess and, you know, trying to live, you know, a, a balanced life and this type right. of thing. And I think mm-hmm. it is important for uh, for leaders and thinkers uh, to, to remember that. Now, this is all on the backdrop of, and we're going to, uh, you know, I'll ask you what you think about climate change in a minute, but sure. this is all on the backdrop of a either a liberal power grab which it likes you know likes to be kind of characterized as or we're heading towards literally oblivion <laughs> and and i <laughs> and 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 i just don't get how you if 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 um if there's somebody like joe who can have umpteen number of people on the show talking about uh you know, the resources and, mm-hmm. you know, what resources there are. I'm not saying share it with anybody. I'm saying just the frivolous purchasing of ridiculous stuff. And I grew up in that. I think mm-hmm. I was, you and I were probably part of like, I had I had no restraints, a complete untethered libertarian go out and the world is your oyster, right? Well, it, you know, at what point do we say, well, maybe that isn't the, such a good thing to do? You know, and now yeah. I'll ask you about like how do you approach this um, this idea of, of of climate catastrophe and alarmism or reality of, of a crisis? I, I I used to get emotional about this kind of stuff, right? Because the of the uh, so, and I think because the people involved, I, I grew up kind of a in a in a again a, a liberal left leaning environment. And and what I liked about it, and still like about it, is the idea of being a, a a steward of the environment and the community. Like I went on the Clearwater boat in the Hudson River, and 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 re- and learned how the factories that used to be up the river had polluted the Hudson River, and it took years for it to clean up. And um, and I and 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 I still am very much into that, right? That the idea of pollution and, and caretaking the environment and not being sloppy with where we are, and not taking it for granted, like the like you know the world's your oyster, yeah, right. But if you destroy it and you're bad to it, you're going to have a problem. Um, with I don't know, climate change is such a, another one of these gigantic topics that I don't even know where to start, and a lot of it is because I think the people. 
the tragic people that get involved in it, the power hungry power grab types, like this is a V like Patrick Moore, the guy who founded Greenpeace, James Dellingpole, the writer for uh, one of the British, uh, although I think he got booted, but um, turfed, as you guys would say in Canada. Um, they talk about how the environmentalist movement got taken over by the rabid left. And that it was um, like Delling Paul's book is what called watermelons and they're green on the outside, but red on the inside. And Patrick Moore said, you know, he saw his own outfit, Greenpeace, get infiltrated and um, and used for like very far left leaning ends. And that's not why Greenpeace had been formed. And so, you know, I see things like that. I, you know, I voted for Bill Clinton, as I mentioned, in 1992 and got interviewed on TV as a 20 year old because he was the person who talked about global warming. And that he was time to, you know, take a look at this and not just let it go by the wayside. And it just seemed to go downhill from there. Like the change from global warming to climate change is a little weird. Like, do you mean warming? And then I've been, I'm, I'm maybe not the greatest person to talk about this because I used to bicker with people on social media. And, you know, it would be, there'd be what we used to in the old days call, be called an Indian summer day right? Where it's November and it's 60 degrees and sunny. And, you know, people on social media, smart people that I went to high school with and, and, and university, oh, global warming. But then if it were unseasonably cold, let's say it's the end of March and it's sub freezing, you know, hey, look, how can it be global warming if it's this cold at the end of March? And they'd say, no, 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 no not so fast. That's weather. We're talking about climate. And I'm like, look, man, you can't do that with a reasonably, if, if you have the, the common sense that God gave the average rabbit, you can't do that with somebody and say, well, when it fits what I am, my team, let's say, it's what I say it is. But then if something goes against it, and these are doofy little things, an Indian summer day, a random cold day in March. But then people just dig in their heels and go crazy over this stuff. So I kind of just started to back away. And, you know, I, I see the and I just look at lots of different things. And, and the, I think the alarmism, Daniel, is part of the problem. Mm. Right. And our brain dead politicians, I, I think I don't know which country has more. I think we do. Although the guy running the show up there is a little odd in your neck of the woods. Um, he does have good fashion sense with those costumes he wears, but, uh, you know, he's Indian and then he's Asian. Like he's very good with that. Um, funny guy, man. Uh, so I, you know, it's, I know I'm all over the map and I apologize, but I, I guess the people who are alarmist and talking about doom and let me give you, let me give you two short examples. Um, do you remember, I didn't read it, but you've heard of a book called The Population Bomb. It's written in the early 70s, Paul Ehrlich. Mm -hmm. You know, he basically said in no uncertain terms, unless something was done right now, this is 1972, 74, there will be no Great Britain in the year 2000. Mm. Between 1990 and 2000, it's, it's over. Unless something happened right now. Now, he's a tenured professor emeritus somewhere now. I want to say Stanford. Like if, if one of my ninth graders were that wrong on a test, I'd pull him aside and be like, you need to get some special help. Mm -hmm. Like you, you need, you need tutoring. Something is wrong, but because he's that kind of alarmist type and he's, you know, blended into the, you know, the, the climate change, climate, global warming world, he's a full fledged professor. The other thing yeah. is it's easy to find big shots, usually, but not always politicians saying how by 2013, 2015, right? The ice on Kilimanjaro is supposed to be gone. The North Pole ice is supposed to be gone, right? All of these things are supposed to be gone because the earth is getting hotter. And then when they don't happen, nothing, just silence. I mean, if the earth is getting warmer and we're having a crisis, okay, fine. There, there, then, then there needs to be some kind of movement in that direction. But I see this just a, a, a huge laundry list of people 
in positions of power who all seem to be wealthy. Um, and I'll end the rant with this, this latest Copenhagen conference. Mm. You can't fly to Copenhagen in multiple private jets with black tinted windowed SUVs driving to the conference. And those SUVs weren't from Glasgow. They were brought overseas, probably in a C-130 or something huge like that. And then tell me that I need to pay more money as a carbon tax or climate tax or lock down for climate lockdowns. I'm sorry, it's just not happening. So and I apologize yeah. for, for being all over the map on that. That was just me throwing haymakers. I think uh, it's I think it's a sentiment of of of, uh, of 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 the average American, really. I think that's the pointing out the hypocrisy of the situation, and it's not an mm-hmm. easy situation. But I want to point out a couple things, and we've you know we've got about eight eight minutes left, and so it'll be the good way to kind of wrap up the, okay. the first episode here. Um, I'm trying to think of it a, a little bit differently. OK, and, and I, I think I think we have um, someone like Vox Day to help us with this. OK, so mm-hmm. he's an um, he's 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 unapologetic. He he does not apologize for being a nationalist. Right. OK, so I think this is part of the conversation that we we seem to miss. OK, that we're in a particular point in history as a result of um, a global I- economic infrastructure that somehow feels that we have to bring everybody on the planet along. Okay, right? Mm -hmm. Now, um, I'm not advocating for leaving anybody behind, but you'll see that on a small scale, um, you're going to do something different for your family versus the guy down the street. Mm -hmm. So it seems delusional to me that we're trying to come up with a utopian like um, world government that's going to move everything for everybody in the direction of prosperity for everybody. Right. Mm. And um, the, the forces working against that will be a, an international trade policies and big business, which again, the, the average person has no ability to uh, infiltrate communities uh, in ancient Greece, we used to call these polises, mm-hmm. have no ability to do anything on a community level. We have the ability to follow orders. And I think this is why we're seeing a flare up of the libertarian, the libertarian is because this is ridiculous. We're getting stuff thrown down our throat. And when it comes, when, when push comes to shove and resources get constricted, um, are, are, are we just going to hand over our guns and hand over our resources and go, well, yeah, you know what? We had our time. And I just don't think human populations work that way. Yeah, they don't. Period. Yeah. Not going to happen. Just yeah. period. They just don't work that way. And right. um, it doesn't mean that there's not suffering in the world. It doesn't mean uh, that there's not suffering in your family or my family or, mm-hmm. you know, in, in America, but the mm-hmm. idea or in Canada, but I think there's like this, there's a fundamental disconnect with the way history is actually unfolded and the way populations actually, uh, you know, like what are we in the, the only time where we haven't had like ever present war mm-hmm. where, right. You know, it was less than it was 80 years ago when we were going toward a fight for the identity for the actual freedom of America and mm-hmm. basically the free world. And now right. we go, well, I don't know. I mean, the entire population breaks down this way of the world. You have um, 40 percent of the population is between three ideologies. One's India, one's China and one's America. Period. Those countries contain 40% of the world population. Wow. And they're oh. all very ideologically different. Okay, so mm-hmm. the Americans are very, um, and this is pervasive in, in all of uh, social science, right? The individualistic mm-hmm. country is America. It's not a pejorative, it's just that's the way it is. Mm-hmm. The, the communistic kind of shared, you know, for the greater good of the authoritarian sort of country is, and we all know, that's, that's held up by China. Mm-hmm. India has much more of a, um, you know, relaxed kind of easygoing kind of like you just kind of flow with the flow sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. So 
the way I see it is you have these main thrusts in 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 all of society as a ideology. And there's a very distinct possibility that um you know, the exceptionalism, as it's pejoratively referred to in an American sort of characterization, there's no guarantee that that's going to actually remain. Mm -hmm. And so at what point do, do, do populations say, actually, we like that, we want that, we want to defend that? And I think that's the root of, of um, you know, there simply just isn't enough resources for everybody to equally share, right? And it, it sounds harsh. Mm -hmm. you take it this way and you think, all of the global um, economics, I know it's not a zero-sum game, but it's a quick back-the-envelope sort of calculation. Mm -hmm. I think it's something like $17 trillion in terms of total, uh, you know, don't quote me on that, but it's something mm -hmm. like this. And if you divide it by the entire population, you end up with something like $10,000 a person, between ten dollars and $17,000, mm -hmm. depending on whether you're talking about something like PPP, which is the the purchasing parity of, of uh, individuals across the world or uh, gross domestic product. Right. Mm -hmm. And so what you, what you think about is you think it's just not doable. It just doesn't work. The math doesn't line up. And in, I think it was 2018, I was uh, qualified to run for the green party of Canada as uh, you know, and I remember talking to um, a philosopher, philosophy professor from UBC, and he said to me, remember the people. And I never quite understood what he meant at, the, at that time. But every time I think about uh, green initiatives or mm -hmm. I think to myself, OK, that's great. Um, what about the people? Like, what does this mean when you right. want to ration oil down to a bare minimum? What does it mean? Right. Right. What is it? <laughs> yeah. What does it's, it mean for people? Yes, yes, and and it, it's the the way I the way it, it transfers in my head the way you when you talk like that is the inability or refusal to recognize trade offs. Like if you limit oil or you say you can't, you know, population X, you now can't do this, you can't do this. Like, well, there are trade offs that are going to happen. There are things that are going to go wrong, and regular folk oftentimes can't can't deal with those trade-offs. They can't handle, I mean, you talk about the, you know, $10,000 a person, you know, well then all of a sudden, if you start limiting things and chipping around the edges uh, of what they have and their resources, it gets really tight really quickly. So, you know, may, maybe it's the, maybe it's the tragic cycle, you know, talking about going, you know, going back to the classics where, um, you, it, there, there's, there are trade-offs and, and life can be tragic and oftentimes it will, and you have to realize that. So, you know, your, your philosopher professor, you know, said, remember the people, you know, I, I think that's well put, you know, because I think that is so often forgotten. It's partisan team play and, you know, my, my tribe, so to speak, has to win and virtue signaling, you know, a lot of the problems with the internet and social media, you, it brings out the worst in people. And so this huge toxic brew of everybody forgetting about the people, mm -hmm. and, which is really what matters, and trying to see to it that they get a, they chalk up a win for their side. You know, I mean, it's kind of a childish explanation on my point, but, you know, because you spoke well on all of these issues, but it seems to be that that's the case. Like Tom Sowell always talked about trade-offs. He's like, yeah, you can, you can not use oil, right? You can get rid of fossil fuels, but the trade-off is in most parts of the world, they're never going to develop. And many parts of the United States, you're going to flip the switch and the light's not going to go on. So yeah, is that a trade-off you want? Yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. you guys know that with the Athabasca Basin and all the oil and the uranium that's up there, right? I'm telling you right now, my my Canadian mining stocks are doing quite well, Daniel. Thank you very much. You guys are great. I'm having well, a good time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, on that note, I mean, hey, we're already past an hour, and yes. uh, lots of generalizations. I know we're yes. going to dig into it as we as we keep going. Right. Um, you know, hopefully, it can be a, a little bit more of a uh, you know focus on the education. But that was fun. Mm -hmm. That was that yes. was really fun, Douglas. And right, we're going to do it again next week. Great, great. I look oh, forward sounds. to it. Thanks again. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Okay. Count me in.
All right. Thanks, man. We'll see you next week. Okay. You got it. Take care. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye bye.